Thank you for that, thank you for that, Russell. And thank, Josh, thanks for coming, everybody. And uh, half of you from Sweden, half of you from everywhere else. So, wow, you know. <laughs> and and he was to say, um, I hardly know where to. I'm going to start with um, this simple slide. I, I, I think which is uh, it's got um, it's got no got no axis on it at all. It's just a graph. But isn't it interesting that everything that technology has touched, everything has become exponential, whether that's the speed of decoding the human genome, whether it's the rate of adoption of mobile phones, whether it's an exponential curve, I think characterizes the whole thing. Technology has touched education. I've been to every single bet show since they started. I'm very old. <laughs> and uh, boy, technology has touched education hugely. But I don't think any of us have really thought hard about um, what's happening up at this end. You know, what does what does exponential education really look like? What does you know? I guess for sure, every child on the planet with a, a pocketable device that connects them to the rest of the world. HD video streaming from every pair of glasses in real time, every every experience that you have visually recorded forever. I mean, you can think about all those things. And what does it do to learning? And I just wanted to explore a little bit of that with you from looking at what people are doing with their learning um, uh, around the world. I, I would say in the UK at the moment, we're in this position. I don't know well, how well you can see this. Like this screen has been set for 10-year-old people, so... <laughs> In case you're wondering why it's down there. But I do think we're at a moment when, to be honest, uh, money is tighter. And, and I mean, with Sweden, money isn't so tight as it is here in, in, in England, in Australia. It's positively generous. Um, in Singapore, they're still investing. And in Detroit, golly gosh, you know, people are, are desperate for, for any money at all. But as money gets tighter, it's very clear that, that we've got some choices. One, one choice would be, can we go back in time and build education the way the way it used to be? Um, well, you know we can't because the world has moved. Um, the jobs have changed. The children's expectations have changed. We've been listening this morning to children from all around the world talking about their learning. I've asked them all pretty much the same question. The question is, um, what have you enjoyed most in your oh, hello? <laughs> <Not you. laughs> The question is, what have you enjoyed most in your learning? What's been, um, and they've all said, this has been the project-based work, it's been the work where we felt ownership, it's been the work that's been really hard, it's been the tough work, it's been the work that spills out beyond the school day, that lasts us right into the, right into the evening. I've asked them all, um, what's the latest you've been doing your schoolwork? And uh, they've come back with some terrifying answers of 10.30 to 11.30. There's always the work that they want to do. So it's uh, the world's moved on, and I can't see that we can go back to putting them in rows. We've tried in uh, in England. We tried productivity. We tried saying to our teachers, "Would you mind working a little harder, um, maybe with a little less resources?" But you can ask them to do that once, but you can't ask them every year to work a little harder, or they die. You know, it's uh, <laughs> or run away, or just fall over, you know, turn to drink. <laughs> so um, I don't think we can do that. And one possibility, of course, would be to let somebody else do it, just get somebody else to come and, and make education happen. And um, you know, I'm sure there are big companies, um, Pearson, News International, and there are little tiny people, like parents, who would like to take over that, that job. But I think in terms of schools, um, we haven't had a lot of luck in terms of asking other people to do it. So mostly what we're facing as money gets tighter is we can't go backwards, we can't ask for productivity, we don't want to give up and ask somebody else to do it, so let's do it differently. And, and what does differently look like gets to be really interesting, I think. Um, let's look at some of those different lists. And um, I've got a couple of uh, little examples here, I hardly know where to start, but I think I'm going to start with this one. This is a school I'm involved with on the south coast of England, Portland, um, the head teachers um, and a lot of the community decided we could we could do learning better on the island. Um, the island, look here it is, it's um, right down here on the south coast. This is a aerial photograph of the British Isles, so there's lots of cloud, I can't, <laughs> couldn't get a very clear picture. Um, but it is an island and uh, it's 
the, the school that we're getting to build there together is for everybody, it's for every family, for every child. I mean, it's genuinely inclusive because look, there's nowhere else to go, you know, <laughs> there's an edge, there's water. Um, and uh, we have some exceptional small schools on the island. Um, the smallest school I'm working with around the world's only got four children in it, so by small, I mean really small. You know? But this is a school, my granddaughter actually goes to this school, so it's a fabulous school. But by the time the children get to university level, the performance is not as good as it, as it maybe um, should be. So together we're, we're doing effectively this. We're building a school that uh, goes right through, from naught right through to 21. Um, so you'll be able to graduate from this school in, in the fullness of time. You'll start as a baby and you won't leave to have a degree if you want to. You can go other places, but why would you want to stop? <laughs> um, it's a place that's built around um, schools within schools. So uh, although there's 1,800 children, you'll never be in a community of more than it's about 350 actually. You'll be in a little, a little community. And I know some of you are in those sort of schools already. They're pretty effective. It's a school built on stage, not age. Nobody's going to say to you, you can't do that until you're 11, or you can't do that until you're 16. It raises the interesting question about how early might children graduate. Uh, you know, I think most of what you were doing at 21, you know, 16-year-olds are mainly doing now, you know. <laughs> All of it. <laughs> um, so why wouldn't that include their education? Why, why couldn't we, you know, well, why couldn't we graduate at... at well, we know you can. Look, here's, um, here's, a, here's a little letter that maybe gives you a sense of, of, uh, of all that. Let me just find it. Um, a school in Australia. And here's young Ben. All well done, people will want these. Uh, these are proper seats. They look a bit like latrines, but they are actually... <laughs> um, I don't know how well you can see this, um, this, this letter, but um, this was a lad in, um, in Melbourne. And uh, when, I, when I saw him for the first time, which was at, at Melbourne's um, Listen to Learners event a um, year and a half ago, uh, he, he had got fed up with waiting for the other children in his maths class to catch up. So he thought, well, okay, maybe, um, maybe I could help them to get better at maths. So he's written some iPhone apps, uh, which is... They're quite good, they're on the app store, you can, you can download them. And he saw me, I'm a professor, he asked me how can I learn better programming. So I pointed him at some degree level courses where he might learn better programming. 15 years old, so a 15 year old boy. And I pointed him at some programming courses, which I'm sure you know that kids can do great programming uh, at a young age. And um, I did all that in October, and he then mailed me back Look, you can see in February to say that actually it was all going pretty well. He was, um, look, he reckons he's going to get three distinctions in the three modules that he'd enrolled in. The three modules that he'd enrolled in, this is while he's doing his schoolwork. And, uh, but he hasn't written to tell me that. He's written to, to, to apologize, really, that, that um, in the next study period he's dropping down to two. Um, university modules because he's going to be really busy because he's busy setting up a business with his dad and um, because his iPhone applications have been going out of the door at two to three hundred um, a day <laughs> and uh, that's looking like a good business to him so here he is at 15 you know three university modules of distinction dropping down to two setting up a business so you know it, I just ask you that gentle question of I wonder how good our children might be and one of the big shocks in the show really has always been that as we go around the show we see children doing exceptional stuff lots of people have got but we keep limiting when that can happen and we limit how much they can do so 